This to me is one of the biggest issues I think in Christianity is that we rely on God's formulas for so many other things in our life that are intangible, that are abstract, that can't be proved, that can't be negated. You can go around and tell everyone forever, believe and be saved, believe and be saved because we don't see what happens after they die. But you can't say do these five things and you'll be healed because the people that have done those five things are not always healed. And so you know it doesn't work. So you have to make excuses for God where you say it was your faith that got in the way. You're not a good believer. Shame on you. How dare you lose trust in God. Don't you know his ways are higher? Don't you know his will comes before yours? This verse alone, I think, could and should deconvert the masses, but it won't. You'll continue to make excuses for it, and I have no idea how you do it. Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Tuesday takedown, not of people, but just of bad ideas and bad apologetics. And today we are looking at an apologetic on healing. This comes from Sean McDowell, who I know many of you know because I've been inundated with you guys saying, hey, please make a response video to this video or this video or this video. I haven't gotten to those specifically yet. When I saw this one that he did on healing, I really wanted to discuss it because not too long ago on my Sunday video of 20 common Christian commands that Christians seem not to like to follow, I actually covered quite a bit of healing. And that's something I wanted to go deeper into because I think it is one of the most problematic things for the believer. Sean here explains why sometimes God heals and sometimes he doesn't and how that doesn't always mean it's from a lack of faith. I want to deconstruct his message here. It's just a short one minute clip. Again, I'm sure many of you know Sean, but he is a professor at Biola University, has a huge YouTube presence, over 180,000 subscribers. And so this information is getting out to a lot of people. Now, before I show you the video, I want to make one other caveat. I think when people think of healing, healing. Sometimes they think of the crazy evangelical fundamentalist side of faith healing and people walking again for the first time, the blind regaining sight, etc. And that's a huge part of it. Evangelicals with that kind of belief make up about 40% of the belief system in the United States for people that have professed themselves as Protestant. And these kinds of big production faith healings are very much still a thing. But I would suggest that even your average Christian, even your very progressive Christian still prays when they're sick, when they're hurt, when they have an illness, or especially when their loved one is, or someone's in the hospital, etc. I can't think of any time in my own Christian community, whether it's on the very fundamentalist side or the very progressive side, I can't think of one time someone has been in the hospital and a group of Christians didn't go to pray for them. That someone got a horrible diagnosis and people didn't go lay hands on and pray for these people. This is a belief, and rightly so, if you read the New Testament, that God heals those who seek him, that act out faith in believing that he will do so. And we're going to get into all the verses here in a second. So I just want to say this isn't one of those videos I think you can just put to the side as Brandon's talking about fundamentalist stuff again. I think that this impacts each and every single believer. And I think that a lot of believers have been hurt and had doubts and just so much confusion around why am I not healed? Why did this person not get healed? Why did we pray? Why does it seem like this has no effect, etc.? And I want to cover all of that. So let's start with Sean's video, though. Is a lack of healing the result of a lack of faith? Sometimes people might not get healed because they haven't expressed faith. James says you have not because you ask not. But it does not follow that every time somebody is not healed, it's because they lack faith. Ultimately, why God heals some and why he doesn't heal others is God's sovereign will and his choice. We might not understand. The question is, are we going to trust him? So please don't think that if you've asked God and he hasn't healed you, it's necessarily because you have a weak or a lack of faith. That's bad theology. And that's bad logic and bad theology. And we're going to get into both of those concepts here. But first, I just want to say, who is this video for. You know, I see these kinds of videos all the time. Some big apologist makes a quick one minute video. And I also want to say, I understand it's one minute. I'm sure he has more to say on the subject, but still he chose to put this out. So what is the point? You've used one verse from James. That's a little bit random that could be applied in many different fashions. You've essentially just said, well, God's going to do whatever he wants. Anyways, don't lose trust in him. And if you do lose trust in him, that's bad theology. It's just more kind of Christian shaming, I believe for their doubt and questions and also expect Expecting God to do what he says he's going to do and doing what apologetics is, making excuses for God, saying we can't understand. I mean, this hits so many things so quickly on the bingo card of bad Christian apologetics that I'm almost at a loss of how to respond. But don't worry, I won't be. We're going to. I think the first thing to look at is kind of his opening statement here, which is that if God heals you sometimes and other times he doesn't, 
it doesn't follow that the reasons he doesn't is because you didn't have enough faith. Well, then what is the reason, right? He goes on to say that it's God's sovereign will when he chooses to heal and when he doesn't. So then what does our faith have to do with it? What do our prayers have to do with it? If God is going to do whatever he wants to do, regardless of what we ask or how we ask it, then we need not have faith. We need not pray. Well, Brandon, you don't understand. God actually knows who will pray and who will pray in a faithful way. And that's part of what went into his will. So you still have to do your part. I've always hated that line of thinking. I think that makes no sense whatsoever. Is this how people really conceptualize of an all-powerful, all-knowing God? We're told when we pray to only pray for God's will anyways. Maybe it's not God's will that you get better. So if it's your will that you get better, but it's not God's will, and you're praying that you get better, you're not going to get better according to the scriptures. A lot of this has to do with just the issues with prayer in general, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, but I don't think that it's bad logic to say, well, if I pray for healing and sometimes I get healed and God says he'll heal me if I have faith and pray for it, then the other times that I pray and have faith and don't get healed, it must be because of my weak faith or lack of faith, right? Let me give you an example that helps make this make more sense. Let's say we have a dad and that dad tells his son, every time you do chores with a good attitude, I'm going to pay you. Now, just to make this example more like God, now this dad disappears. He wrote this down for his son and then left and never came back. And there's no clear communication. Sometimes the son can feel like he's hearing from his dad, but he's not really sure if that's just the voices in his head. And he goes on to do chores and he does them as good as he can with the best attitude. And sometimes money shows up. And in fact, he does this one time, two time, three time, and each time money shows up. So he thinks my dad obviously sees me doing this. I'm following the commands that he gave me and I'm getting the reward that happened. Now on the fourth time, he goes and he does his chores. He has the same great attitude. He even has full trust that his dad's going to come through, but this time no money. The fifth time, no money. The sixth time, money. The seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, no money. What is he left to assume? The only thing he can reasonably assume if he actually believes his dad exists and is the one giving him this money is that the times he did not get paid, he did not do the chores with the right attitude. It's the only variable here. So for the Christian who sees other people getting healed, who believes they've been healed in the past, who prays, who asks for God for this healing, who goes to the elders, who gets anointed with oil, who expects it through faith to happen. When it doesn't happen, what else are they supposed to believe except that there's something wrong with them, that they didn't do something right? Your answer here can't be, well, sometimes God's just not going to do it no matter what you do because his will is sovereign and his ways are higher than yours. That's not what God says. God gives clear instructions for what to do when you're sick, and he says, if you do this, you will be healed. So for both the son in the example and the Christian, when the thing that is supposed to happen doesn't happen, I think the thing that makes way more sense is calling God on his lie. Either one of two things. This God doesn't actually do the things he says he's going to do. So now we have a question of trust, right? And that's what Sean told us. Hey, no matter what here, even if you don't understand what's going on, don't make the mistake of losing your trust in God. Well, trust is earned. If the little boy in my example had never gotten paid, why would he trust that his dad was an honest man? Or if he only gets paid some of the time, even when he knows he had a good attitude, wouldn't he start losing trust in his dad? That's a natural thing. Trust is earned. I don't understand why we owe this to God. So if God says what will happen every time and then it does not happen, I think the best conclusion one can draw is the second part, which is that God is not real. That sickness happens as sickness happens. It is a natural occurring event. And that sometimes on its own through our immune system or through medical professional help, it can be taken care of. And sometimes it cannot. And there are so many factors and so many variables that we can see, that we can track, that have absolutely nothing to do with God. To further my example, what if we found out that every single time money showed up, mom had been around with her purse out? Would that lead you to believe that maybe that father is not there? Because that's what we do with medicine, with doctors, with hospitals. We pray for healing, we do all the right things, but we still pop the Tylenol. We still go get the treatment. We still go get the prescription. We still go have the surgery. And then we say, thank God, look, he really healed me, ignoring the purse on the table. It's added evidence that it doesn't 
happen? How many of those same people would have not been healed or would have died if they didn't take treatment, prescriptions, pills, surgeries, etc.? Would God still have healed them? Well, Brandon, you don't understand. God's using the doctors. God's using modern medicine. What a cop-out. That's not how the example of Jesus is, both in the Old and New Testament. Anytime that there's a healing of any kind, it's never through a physician. And you had doctors. Wasn't our boy Luke a doctor? Wouldn't it have been interesting if any time Jesus wanted to heal someone, he said, hey, thank you for your faith. Go see Luke. But he didn't. He spit in their eyes or whatever, commanded them to get up. Miraculous healing. Doctors are not miraculous healing healers. It's science. End of story. So again, before we get into these verses here, I would just wonder what is the point of this video? What are the Christians who see it supposed to take away? It seems like the goal of this apologist is to say, I don't know. You don't know. We can't know, but it's not God's fault. Well, where does that leave us for next time? Where does that leave us for trust and faith in the Lord? Maybe a shame position of how dare I question God? He has a sovereign will and ways that I don't understand and I just need not lose faith in him. Just try again next time. What bad advice. He says at the very end of his video, that would be bad theology. So let's get into the theology because all he did was list one verse that is not specific necessarily to healing at all. It's just about asking and receiving. So I want to look at three different categories of verses. I want to look at what does the Bible say about illness or sickness? What is it? Why do we have it? I want to look at what God tells us to do when we're sick or examples of what people in the Bible did when they were sick. And then I want to look at prayer. How are we supposed to ask? What should we expect? I think that'll be a better look at theology here than just blaming the Christian that when God doesn't do what he says he's clearly going to do, you definitely don't blame God. That's bad theology. No, that's being a bad slave. Bad slave. How dare you question your master? How dare you bite at the hand that sometimes feeds you? It's not theology. It's a blame game. So let's get into some real theology. Let's look at these verses. I'm going to be using Old and New Testament as we should be if we believe that our God is immutable and always the same, allowing for context, of course. So Exodus 15, 26, he said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the disease I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So we have two things here. And again, you could say, well, this is different. Okay, this is God talking to his chosen people, pre-Jesus covenant, etc. But God is the same. And what is his nature? His nature here is to use sin as punishment and also to be the person that heals that punishment. Okay, we're just setting the stage. Let's move on to Deut 28, 15. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, just doubling down on God likes to use some kind of illness to hurt those who don't obey. Sin is sin, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. We just have different ways of atoning for that sin. Let's move on. Second Chronicles 21, 12. Then the Lord afflicted Jeroboam with an incurable disease of the bowels. First Corinthians, let's move to the New Testament, 11:30. This is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep referencing their sin. James 1.15, then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. I mean, yes, this is such a simple concept that the wages of sin is death. What happened at the fall with Adam and Eve? Death was introduced to the world. Sickness and illness are just a pre-part of the death curse. Luke 9.1-2, through 2, when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim claim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I'm starting to show you a pattern here that often illness or sickness is related to one of two things. It is either because of your sin or it is because you are possessed with an unclean spirit or a demon. Ephesians 6.12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So here again, we're saying it's not flesh and blood. This is not just an illness of our body. This is the spiritual warfare of foot. In Luke 13, 16, we see, and ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. So she's been afflicted with an illness for her whole life for 18 years 
years. And why? Because Satan did it. God has given power to Satan. He has dominion over this earth, supposedly, to inflict sickness and illness, both physically and mentally. How's that free will come in, by the way? There is one exception, by the way, which is not because of sin and not because of Satan, but because of God's glory. This comes to us in John 9. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? This was a man that was blind from birth, by the way. Jesus answered, it was not this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So sometimes we are simply used as pawns in God's chess game, ways for him to enact and show his power and might and glory. Going back to Psalms 103.3, who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? Again, we get credit going to God here as both the giver and the taker away. We see this in Job. We see it in so many places. I don't think it gets much more clear than this. John 5.14, afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Clearly, from the mouth of Jesus himself, he was healed by his faith in what Jesus would do. And Jesus gives a warning, don't keep sinning because it'll happen again. Because that sickness, that illness is a consequence of sin. I'll stop because this is just point one of three that I wanted to use verses from. It's endless. Old and New Testament, God punishing people for their sin with illness, God allowing unclean spirits, this is mainly New Testament, to take over and cause illness. And then God just doing it for his own glory. So I think it's important to lay the foundation of where this sickness first comes from, according to the Bible. Now, we know about germ theory, and I can hear all the Christians saying, yeah, just because we figured out the materialistic elements by which God does this doesn't mean that God's not the one who's responsible. If you want to fight for that right, if you want to fight for the right to believe that your God loves cursing people with illness and sickness and letting demons run around harming his beloved creation, even the little children, etc., like if that's what you want to fight for, you can have it. Believe that. But then be consistent with the belief as we go through the next few points. But again, this was all written in a time before people had an understanding of sickness and how much worse that a lot of these people who were obviously struggling with some kind of mental illness were classified as demonic, demon-possessed, unclean spirits that needed to be cast out, etc. That has been harmful for centuries. It is a very recent phenomenon and only because science has done such a good job proving this point beyond the shadow of a doubt that mental illness is real, that it has to do with many factors, some of which are, you know, chemical imbalances or things of this nature that can be cured. So I ask you, if you believe that the schizophrenic or the bipolar or the depressed or the anxious, which by the way, we were also told just don't. Worst advice ever. Don't be anxious. Fear nothing. As if it would be within our control when it's a true imbalance in the makeup of our brain. How ridiculous. But now we know what that is. And when we take a pill to correct that imbalance, does that mean that the demon that was possessing us, that was causing that, according to the scriptures, is the demon reacting to that pill? What's more likely? That somehow Satan and his horde are affected by a little white pill or that it was never them in the first place and it was the thing that we know the pill addresses. The reason I want to point out that God tries to take credit for illness and sickness is so that we can look at the appropriate reaction when we see how medicine works. Does medicine somehow have a higher percentage chance of increasing the faith of the person that's taken it or the will of God to have that person be healed? Does medicine have the better chance at casting out demons than using Jesus's name, which is the only thing that can cast out demons? It's beyond clear that illness of any kind has nothing to do with God or demons or sin. But if you want to live in the world where we pretend and we adhere to those rules, then let's be consistent as we move into point two about what to do when we are sick. James 5, 14 through 15. Is anyone sick among you? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. There are other verses, but let's just really look at this. This is the most specific instruction. This isn't just have faith, right? We have a whole litany of things to do here. And to guarantee at the end of it, is anyone sick? Anyone, right? I want to remove all excuses here. Go to the elders of the church. Do we still have churches? Yes. Do we still have elders in those churches? Yes. Pray over them and anoint them with oil. Okay, no problem. Most churches in America literally have their little prayer oil. 
their little sickness healing oil. You can go ask any elder in the church to pray for you and anoint you with oil and they will do it. Make sure you do it in the name of the Lord. Shouldn't be a problem. Here's where we get the condition and the reason for Sean's video. The prayer offered in faith. Okay, so we do have to have faith. But what does Jesus tell us about faith multiple times? Faith even smaller than the size of a mustard seed can move mountains or uproot mulberry trees. It seems like having my fever taken away shouldn't be too big of an ask. I'm not trying to move a mountain. So how little faith would we need? I think that's really important to understand what Jesus has said about faith when he's saying to pray by faith because the main excuse, and Sean's trying to be nice about it, but the main excuse you get when you aren't healed, when your prayer isn't answered, etc., is you just didn't have enough faith or you weren't sincere enough. Jesus is saying you don't have to have that much faith. Faith this small will do so much. So let's get rid of that excuse. Let's assume you can have faith. But because that's a gray area, that's the one part of the formula where people are going to push back. And then what does it say? This will make the sick person well. Not this will make the sick person well if God wills it. Not this will make the sick person well sometimes, 30% of the time, 50% of the time. Simply do these things and the sick will be made well. What if we really believed that? I don't believe Christians believe that. It's right here in the New Testament. There's no reason not to believe it. This isn't some Levitical law issue. If you're not going to believe this when it's prescribed so simply, why believe the prescription believe and be saved? Well, <laughs> Brandon, that's a salvation issue. That's pretty different here. Jesus obviously died for our sins and he says if we believe we're saved. Okay, so when it says in the New Testament to do something and get a result, that means it will always be that result, right? Isn't that what you're counting on for your salvation? That because you believe you will go to heaven? Do it for your sickness. There's one reason you don't. We both know it doesn't work. There are the fanatics that have let their kids die because they did this and refused to do anything else because maybe going to the hospital or getting that prescription would be the lack of faith, right? To really have faith means I don't need those other things. I trust my God to do it. Well, bring it in. Now you're acting like a fundamentalist. Now you're taking it too literally. I'm sorry. Is this a metaphor? It's a literal prescription of what to do when you're sick. This isn't one of the contested books in the New Testament. This is canon. You just don't believe it. The inconsistency Consistency is astounding. Meanwhile, you have no problem telling people when they're sick, oh, you must have sinned. Oh, you, you need more faith. Oh, let's take you to the hospital. How hypocritical. I want to just leave it here with just this verse because, again, I said earlier, this to me is one of the biggest issues I think in Christianity is that we rely on God's formulas for so many other things in our life that are intangible, that are abstract, that can't be proved, that can't be negated. You can go around and tell everyone forever, believe and be saved, believe and be saved because we don't see what happens after they die. But you can't say, do these five things and you'll be healed because the people that have done those five things are not always healed. And so you know it doesn't work. So you have to make excuses for God where you say, it was your faith that got in the way. You're not a good believer. Shame on you. How dare you lose trust in God? Don't you know his ways are higher? Don't you know his will comes before yours? No, I don't know that because I'm reading the Bible, because I'm having good theology, and because it's not working. So I am losing trust in God. I am losing faith. I do not understand him. I do not see him as moral and good and holding up his righteous truth. It's this simple. This verse alone, I think, could and should deconvert the masses, but it won't. You'll continue to make excuses for it, and I have no idea how you do it. I'll back off on this verse for a second, though. Let's see. What else should we read here? Psalm 41, 3, the Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him up to health. Isaiah 38, 5, go and say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. We see that not only sickness and illness are cured by God when asked, when prayed for in earnest, but that he will actually just add years to your life. Going back to the New Testament, Mark 613, they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them because that's what was wrong. Guys, the New Testament got it wrong. Jesus got it wrong. They got it wrong about why people are sick. They got it wrong about how to heal the sick. So why do you still hold to it? Why do you still believe in it? Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord who heals. Psalm 32, O Lord my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. Jeremiah 17, 14, hear me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me and I shall be saved for you are my praise. Wouldn't it be beautiful 
if it was that simple. You know what would make me believe in the promise of salvation? Is if Jesus upheld any of the other promises. If any time I got sick, I followed what he said. I cried out. I had faith. I believed. And I was healed. Every time. That God... I would trust to do the other things he says. The problem is we're putting all our faith in the abstract, unverifiable, unfalsifiable claims. And we're making excuses for every single claim that can be shown not to work. This is the formula for religion. This is not the formula for truth. So what I want to end with too is to really triple down here and look at what God says about asking him for things. So these aren't necessarily related to illness, just like Sean used the verse from James that is just about asking and receiving, but I think that it continues to show that God says he will do things that he's simply not doing. So let's look at a few of these. Matthew 7, 7 through 8, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you for every one who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened again i don't hear any conditions here i don't hear any probabilities i hear do this and you will get this again imagine if anyone in your human life said something this clear to you and then never followed through or only sometimes followed through why would you continue to believe them why would you continue to think they're perfect why would you continue to rely on them you wouldn't why do this with god because he's invisible? Doesn't that make it worse? Because he doesn't actually ever answer you? Doesn't that make it harder? Or is it because you have apologists like Sean who would rather shame you for thinking clearly than admit when their God doesn't work? Matthew 21, 22, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Pretty darn simple. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So again, maybe a little condition of faith on that one, but I know that people can believe. And again, we don't need that much faith according to Jesus himself. John 14, 13, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. How clear. Why don't we believe this? Why don't we act like we believe this? 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. So we get a new condition here. I never said the Bible was consistent, but this one is whatever is already in God's will, which I think makes praying kind of pointless. Again, the other verses contradict this idea, but isn't it God's will for all to be saved, right? Like we can start looking at the things God has said he wills. He wills that none should be lost. So why don't you right now on the other side of this camera, pray for me to be found, right? I'm obviously harming the kingdom here. I know that I've already helped people deconvert. Why not pray that I get found? I'll turn this channel around in a heartbeat. I'll become one of the biggest apologists out there, right? Couldn't God use me for good? That's obviously his will, that none should be lost. Well, I'm lost and I'm helping other people to get lost. So that's in his will. Surely there's someone out there that has enough faith to make it work. So just do it. By not doing it and not expecting it, you're calling God a liar. It really is this simple. And I can hear all the excuses, oh, we shouldn't test God and blah. No, he's saying, all right, it is a test. It is a test to ask for something and expect that it be done, right? And by the way, and I've said this before, and I've covered many examples, God loves being tested. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Long story short, this is one of the biggest inconsistencies I see with Christian belief. And all the excuses, and there's so many for why we don't have to do this, or why God gave us medicine and we should do that instead, or why God gave us mental health counseling and we should rely on that, none of that is biblical. And if we get the basis for everything else in our life, biblically speaking, who to put our faith in, who to love, what commandments to obey, where our salvation rests, etc. To make excuses for the ones that don't work, that have been proven proven to be something other than what the scriptures say about them, to call God on him not coming through with his promises here. Jesus says, let your yes be yes. And he is saying yes every time to anyone who does these things. It is just crystal clear. And I don't know how the church has gotten away with it for so long, holding it over your heads and making it your problem. And here's Sean doubling down on that. I'd encourage you, if you're someone that watches a video like Sean's to try to figure out what you're doing wrong or why God's not healing you or your kids or your loved ones or your friends, to consider what I've said and to seek proper help. 
thankfully, and not thankfully to the Lord, but thankfully to the scientific process and to the men and women who have chosen to contribute and make their lives mission to continue to advance us in these ways. We have things at our disposal that have never been before. And to continue to put your faith in some Iron Age concept of what to do when you're sick instead of fully committing to real help and real treatment is foolish. But Brandon, I'm doing both. It can't hurt to also just pray. Sure it can. How many church groups are praying for you instead of giving you the money for the surgery? How many pastors are encouraging you to look at the sin in your life for the source of this instead of seeing the things that are really affecting it? It can absolutely get in the way. It can be dangerous. And there's plenty of proof of that. And we can make a whole nother video about that. So I'm encouraging you, call a spade a spade. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. We have First Chronicles coming up this Thursday for our Secular Bible Study series. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tier Iconoclast patrons, Sean Skaggs and Jason Rollins, and my atheist advocate patron, Jared Nichols, for their incredible generosity. Also, a big shout out to my secular scholar patrons, of which we have some new ones. All other patrons are listed in the description of each video. Please consider joining this great group if you enjoy these videos or believe in my mission. Thanks and have a great day.